Okay, we're at 1216 and I think uh, we should get started. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the uh, Road to Open Data Certification event, which is co-hosted by the Go Open Data Association and the Canadian Open Data Society. Uh, my name is Yuri Kanga and uh, I'm the Executive Director of Good and I'll be your uh, host for this event. We have a large audience this afternoon. Uh, we have over 70 registered. Um, so to minimize potential disruption, we've muted everyone and request that you stay muted during the presentation. Uh, to confirm your participation in the event, if I could ask everyone to um, uh, provide your name and organization in the chat window. That way we have kind of a roll call of uh, who's actually here. Um, we'll be focusing on three areas today, the potential levels of certification, the process for establishing open data uh, certification and some certification requirement considerations. Uh, it's our intent, this is fairly informal, this meeting, and it's our intent to, um, to have a, uh, a second meeting uh, maybe in a couple of weeks or so, to uh, to look at the outcome of this event and to set up uh, an event that allows you to participate in Zoom room discussions. Um, I'm pleased to uh, introduce to you uh, the panel for uh, today. There's myself and Jonathan Brown, who is the Director of Education for Go Open Data. And then from, uh, from CODS, we have Paul Connor, the executive director, and Eugene Chen, uh, who is the, uh, the chair and, and president for, uh, for the Canadian Open Data Society. Um, we'll start off with Paul discussing the possible levels of open data certification. Uh, and if you have any questions at any time during, um, uh, during this event, I'd ask you to simply start with a queue in the chat and then followed by the question that you have. Um, and please feel free to add any comments or links or what have you uh, at any time during the, uh, during the event. So we have a uh, quick poll, which I just ask you to respond to. Um, Okay, we're just trying to understand who the audience is uh, today. So if you could just pick the one associated with you, that would be great. Well, we've got 25, okay, we've got some more coming in. We've got 27. Give it maybe another couple of couple of seconds and then I'll end the poll. Okay, so just for everybody's information, um, this is the outcome of that poll. Um, 30, 43% are municipal, 36 federal, uh, some from the provinces and the private sector and academia. So thanks very much for that. Um, and I'll move out of this. And uh, Okay, with that, uh, thank you for uh, providing this information. And now I'll turn it over to Paul to speak to the open data certification levels. Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri. Um, so this is merely meant to uh, be suggestive, uh, to spark uh, thought, conversation, ideas. 
Uh, it's not, by no means determinative of our, of our uh, considered approach at this early, early stage. But you see here we have uh, operations, which I imagine could include things like having, uh, putting up the portals, uh, policy analyst, which I imagine again, could include things like the legalities uh, of it and uh, the strategic uh, considerations. Um, analyst, uh, which would be perhaps even applying the data in, in an internal or external context, such as dashboards, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, open data general certification, which I imagine is meant to be a bit more uh, encompassing. And uh, we would also consider the possibility of having a single uh, certification or certification uh, of, of an organization whose uh, personnel uh, have uh, this requisite knowledge. Um, th that's not unlike several professional bodies, uh, including one that I'm affiliate, affiliated with, which has uh, professional individuals and a certificate of authorization of practice for, uh, for the organizations that employ them. Uh, so uh, I hope this is uh, uh, starting to uh, stimulate ideas. I mean, perhaps we've left things out. Perhaps things could be combined. Perhaps there's uh, stuff that uh, just uh, gets evoked from the combination of uh, one or more of these things. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Uh open to uh, questions or suggestions. Uh, if you like to put them in the, uh, in the chat, that would be great. Um, also interested in people who uh, are certified in other organizations and, and could reference what that certification is or a link to the website. It's all part of our trying to do some uh, some understanding of what the, uh, uh, you know, what the certification for open data might be. So open to questions, comments. Oh, and if you could spell out your acronyms, that would be ideal <laughs> if you're suggesting uh, other examples. <laughs> Yeah, the question about uh, whether we would be looking at an exam. Uh, we can talk about that in the requirements. Mm -hmm. which, so Paul, uh, it, might be, it might be useful just to differentiate between your professional association and other types of associations which, which aren't governed by legislation. Oh, absolutely. Just mentioned that as one possible example. Um, I mean, there are examples later on in the slide uh, deck that we'll be uh, showing that are not governed by legislation, for instance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, well... I mentioned that because one of the barriers for newcomers coming to Canada is um, they often lack the experience. And so, while those are very valid, professional associations are very valid, the ones that are legislated, um, it does raise the bar. Well, um, they lack, uh, it, specifically, they're said to lack Canadian experience, but increasingly uh, professional uh, associations, including the one that I'm affiliated with, uh, they're opening it wide up, uh, up because like, yeah, that's discriminatory and we consider it as such. So we look at non-Canadian experience as well, I think. Point well taken. Oh, this is interesting. Thank you for these contributions. This is great. <laughs> yeah, biometric data for identification. Wow. I hadn't thought that far ahead. <laughs> no, I remember they doing that for the uh, GED. And uh, who was the other one doing that? one of the professional associations down in the states for proxy exams uh, 
I see Connie, I see your question there. Uh, and uh, that is something that is under consideration. Uh, it is mentioned later on in the slide deck, I believe. Um, Nathan, hey, Nathan, long time no see. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Progressive. That's, Nathan, that's a really good question. Sorry, uh, uh, Paul, just for the benefit of the video that's yeah. being recorded, uh, if you can repeat the questions, and for some people may not have their screens and they don't see the chat, so even looping back to Connie's point, um, if you don't mind kind of repeating the question and answering to it. Okay, but the chat's recorded separately. We'll, we'll have that as well. Um, so Connie asked, will professional development units be required after certification to keep certification? This is a common thing. And uh, I think it, it's something that we are allowing for the possibility of at this stage, but we're not landing on just yet. Uh, and I think one of the things we'd want to consider in that regard is the pace of change in this field. Um, because if, if the pace of change is moderate, then, you know, you don't have to uh, be overwhelming on that score. But if the pace of change is great, uh, as in the medical field, for instance, uh, then you... Um, then you obviously have to have people paying more attention to the latest developments uh, in a formal way. But uh, let's just say we're going to put a pin in that for now. Uh, and Nathan asked, will these levels be as progressive, uh, building off of one another or separate and standalone? Like the way I read this slide here, it looks pretty like standalone, except for the general certification, which could have elements or much of the other levels uh, included in it. Um, and then that is something else that we would look for feedback on, uh, you know, uh, citing other examples or one's own experience or what have you. And I'll be addressing that in my slides or my slide. <laughs> yep. Okay. Um, yeah. And thanks for the feedback. This is, this is very helpful. Uh, for us moving forward. And Paul, if you have nothing else, and I think uh, I'll, I'll move the, uh, go over to the next slide and invite uh, Eugene to uh, speak to some considerations around uh, uh, the process. Thanks, Yuri. So a uh, couple of things. Uh, before I dive into this quickly, I probably should have done this at a high level, but uh, there's only a few slides here for this entire presentation. First one was around levels, and this one's just a little bit about the process. The next slide that we're going to be going through is around the requirements and thinking about the considerations for that, and Jonathan will dive a little bit more deeply into that. Um, just wanted to give you guys a broad a high level idea of uh, what you'll see for next year um, in, in the next bit here. So the questions around um, kind of requirements, I have, feel free to kind of like provide more feedback there as well. Um, so as a process, these are um, some estimated initial timelines and in terms of what we think might happen in the next uh, little bit here. So the first thing I will do is do a bit of an environmental scan of which part um, this conversation that we're having with you is part of that, to have an understanding of what you care about, what you think might work, might not work. Um, obviously to scope the project based off of some of the context around the scan, um, look at some collaborators and look at some sponsors for this project. And then after that, Yuri, I'm gonna need you to help me click. Sorry, um, we'll go through a process of co-design and then um, start the initial um, drafts of uh, certification framework, put together some initial requirements, and then go through a bit of a pilot testing uh, process where in approximately let's say seven to nine months, uh, we'll be doing that as a bit of a pilot. Uh, maybe not for every single um, one of the certifications, but uh, it might be some combination of it. And then obviously in about a year's time, hopefully get to the point of implementing them all together. Um, that's all I got from my slide. So um, 
happy to answer any questions if you have any with regards to these timelines. I'm assuming not too many, but I'm happy to answer any. I will give you guys, uh, sorry, yeah. Feel free to ask any questions about this if you have them, but they are an initial kind of estimate for now. And I'm just gonna assume not, and if they do come up, happy to answer them, but uh, we can move on to Jonathan's part around, I think what most of you are most interested here around the um, kind of the requirements and uh, I think we'll probably want to open it up for uh, asking you guys some questions as well. But please go ahead. Okay, thanks, uh, Eugene. Uh, we will have kind of whatever time we have left at the end, we'll open it up to uh, any questions on, on any of these subjects. Uh, so we can circle back to the, uh, uh, the process, any ideas that you you have later on then. So having, uh, having said that, and thank you again, Eugene, we'll move on to Jonathan. And want a special thank you to Jonathan, who is currently in Germany. Uh, so, you know, the, what is it, six hours? So we're, you're in the middle of dinner, and we apologize for interrupting uh, that. But uh, over to you, Jonathan. Thanks, Yuri. Uh, it's happy hour. So uh, welcome, everybody. And I, I'm glad that we have a sort of an even distribution between federal and municipal. And the reason I say that is uh, the federal government is the only government currently in Canada that has any fiscal room. And the municipal governments essentially are, well, I shouldn't use the word bankrupt, but they're certainly in dire straits when it comes to, to, to finances. So one of the things I'll start off with is just an anecdotal story of where uh, I think there are great opportunities for the two levels of government to work together. And we hosted an event, uh, Go Open Data, last year and the year before that as part of GIS Week, the year before that. And it was from the Stats Canada group. It's called the Linked Open Data Environment. And Alessio Alexandro, um, or sorry, Alexandro Alicia, if I get it right, I always get his name backwards. He was working, he did a workshop on using MapTile, one of his, uh, one of his uh, staff, senior policy workers. And what I learned from that is that they are willing to mentor uh, staff from municipalities who are thinking of uh, up uploading their data in a standardized format. And that's great opportunity for municipal staff to be able to take advantage of that because quite often the municipal staff don't have access to these kinds of resources. And I, I'm speaking particularly for the smaller, medium-sized municipalities. The larger ones, of course, have a lot of capacity. Their challenge is how to share the open data across their organizational structures, the enterprise level. That's a big challenge. I worked at the Ontario Ministry of Education uh, for 17 years, and we went through several um, horizontal policy integration initiatives. And it was always a challenge to, uh, to do that. So that's just by way of introduction. Now, one of the ways in which you can do that is through this certification. So you're identifying different pathways that are based on certain standards. And you'll see in my slides here, uh, there are three basic levels that researchers look at, at certification or program. Uh, the first one is the informal. Examples of that would be YouTube, um, GitHub. They actually have a site, GitHub for government, GitHub for students. And um, another example might be OpenStreetMap. And then each country has its own user group. The challenge with GitHub um, is that you usually get a lot of participants up front, and then a very few maintainers. And the maintainers then become invested in that project, and therefore it becomes less flexible over time. But it's certainly a good way to get going, and it is a great way because it, it leaves it open to the individual to be able to choose that pathway um, through informal learning. And there's just so much out there, uh, not just in YouTube and GitHub, but also social media, 
And so those are things that most young people are growing up with that just as part of their, their formal education. So I, the second bullet there is called non-formal vocational education. So examples of that would be uh, like share, the person that shared in the chat, um, Esri has that particular, I think it was a three-year program as I, as I recall. And uh, the other person put in there an example of where they have to create a portfolio. And these are actually assessed by trained professionals. And then they're given a certification through non-formal training. And, and in that case, they may pay for it, but more you'll see more examples now of industry setting up um, courses that are free online. For example, I'm participating in a hackathon called the Atlantic Hack -a -hack, Aqua Hack, and we're looking at uh, green infrastructure. And down in the States, there's a whole federated report, uh, repository that serves serves the courses between Esri's uh, Greenstorm Infrastructure, Bentley, these are big corporations. And they're, they're all free. A lot of the courses there are free and they actually will build them into the different pathways that you need to get into that profession. So that's another example of open data that uh, takes advantage of, of what is called a, a, a federated repository. Now, the other aspect of these federated repositories is that you can toggle it on, toggle it off. So if you're, you're an organization in government and you want to share something, for example, let's take the Ontario case of uh, information, Land Ontario Information, which is a, a database, a GIS database. They have a lot of internal presentations. Every year they have the GIS Summit, which just recently took what occurred. It's not open to people like myself, I'm retired, so I'm no longer part of the public service, but they're starting to think, well, we can, we can block out things that we're not allowed to share. We'll just blank those out and then we'll share it. And that's another good example of what I would call non-formal vocational education, where you can begin to build bridges between the, the, the government sector, what they're doing internally with their professional development, lunch and learns and everything I participated in when I was part of government, they also have executive leadership programs that uh, get government leaders and senior management to, that are being groomed and they go on uh, international tours and, and networking and project-based learning. And then of course, the last one is the formal, the academic. And the formal academic is a legislative process in Ontario. Universities and colleges can do these things, but they have to apply to the Ontario uh, Ministry of Training College and Universities. And if they want to introduce a new program, that can take uh, four weeks. Well, it uh, can take up to four weeks. Um, and then they have they just cycle it through. So uh, you, you just have to hit that point of where you want to apply a new program through one of the formal institutions. Now, the other part of this formal academic is uh, in Ontario, we have eCampus Ontario, which is funded by the Ontario government. And most jurisdictions across Canada do have these types of distance education for the formal education sectors. And um, one thing I'm really impressed with is that they are starting to look at what are called micro-credentials. So you can go on to the eCampus micro-credential repository and you can search for different things. You, if you put in there open data, you'll see that some courses have been designed by, and paid for by eCampus Ontario. I remember talking to the person that was doing the design. It was uh, uh, involved Teresa from uh, Carleton University and three other professors talking about how they're using open data in their courses. And then that's all made free through eCampus Ontario. And then um, the last one, all of the above, uh, the XAPA. So this is... Uh, XAPA has been around for quite a while. And so a lot of the learning management systems are starting to be compliant with this experience API, uh, which includes a learning record store. So what it does, it's sort of like an HR on steroids so that I have this learning record store. And if I plug into one organization, say I'm working for the government and then I retire and I go and I work in another organization like Go Open Data or CODS. And if I'm doing things that are, uh, what you would call non-formal learning and I want a badge, then I can earn that. And then that 
somebody certifies it, in this case, it would be uh, CODs or Go Open Data. It would be certified by that organization. And then that would go into my learning record store. And I would it would be my, my social insurance for lifelong learning. And it would be protected by this standardized uh, format. Now, <laughs> I looked at what that would cost if we were to do that uh, using machine learning and XAPI standards. And uh, it's free to set up a, a learning record store individually. And then some organizations that are doing this, like Watershed, they charge $4,085 per month to run that, uh, that uh, XAPI resource across your organizational structures. Okay, so I'm just gonna leave it at that. And in terms of testing online and uh, the, that kind of stuff, well, I think hands down, everybody is going to jump on chat GPT. And uh, when I was flying over to Europe, there was an article in the New York Times talking and the professors were all going, they were all panicking about this uh, chat GPT writing all the exams. Well, guess what? A 22 year old student who graduated from a high school out of Toronto is doing his PhD in Princeton. He was home over Christmas and sitting in a cafe and he wrote JPT zero, which uses the human, uh, it detects the human creativity, which is called bursting, as opposed to an algorithm like chat GPT, which is not, it's an algorithm, so it's ubiquitous and it's continuous. It was able to identify, you can paste in assignments and you can, and this GPT zero will determine whether that was written by a machine or by a human being. So that doesn't solve all of the dilemmas of uh, machine learning taking over our, our, our exams and proxies and all that, but it is an interesting one and it's coming. The student was interviewed and in the interview, he did say that he didn't think it would be right to remove uh, chat GPT because it is here to stay. We need to learn how to live with it. And so some of the professors are starting to look at using GPT to write uh, different assignments, climate change, for example, or procurement, and right, we could write a strategy on an open data certificate using something like this, a machine learning. So I'm going to leave it there and open it up to uh, conversations. And if somebody can monitor the chat, because I don't have it open, do we have any comments, questions from the chat? That was great, Jonathan. Uh, I guess the other thing that's important, and we haven't spoken to too much is is the experience factor um you know the hands-on experience at whatever position and what the requirements are for your position to be part of uh the assessment of, of certification at a particular level um so there's lots to think about here and we've gotten some um some information on the uh, on the chat. Um, I'd open it up to the floor for any any questions or comments that you might have because this this is an important one and uh, you know we're just starting to look at it now. So I'm interested in uh, yeah. in the Yuri. thoughts of the participants. Yes. Yeah. So there is a comment about the uh, standards, the ISO nineteen one one five standards. That's a great point. Um, there are also standards that were uh, presented at the International Open Data Conference in Buenos Aires back in 2019 or 2018. So that's another thing you can be looking for. Now there's an, uh, the George Mason University has a, it's called the REG Hub and it's using machine learning to look at the different REGs and it's, it's part of the cutting red tape. And it would be, it would pull up all of those different standards based on what you're looking at and look at uh, just where the legislation or statutory uh, standards lie on, on, on a spectrum. So good point there. Thanks for that comment in the chat. And I think the other thing we should we should uh, mention is Yuri is that with the recording we'll also put together. I've started a, a collection in Microsoft Edge, and uh, I can share that as a notebook or as a if I export it as an Excel. 
So I, there are some examples like Coursera, um, edX. These are, I didn't mention this, I forgot to mention it, but as part of the, it can be both formal and informal. It's like a hybrid. These are offered by the uh, Ivy League um, universities. They'll get maybe 35,000 people signing up and maybe 2% complete, but they use it as a marketing ploy to get students, the top-notch students to register for their programs. And so you're getting um, MIT courseware, for example, they've had open course courseware for a number of years now. And you can take those, even as a high school student, you can take an AP advanced course in physics, chemistry or whatever, and you can count that towards your diploma. Um, and then with MIT, uh, what they use is a process in the formal education systems, it's called prior learning assessment and recognition. And you can challenge for credits, or you can take equivalent training from non-formal sector and apply it to a formal degree or diploma. So that's another avenue to look at. It's called prior learning assessment and recognition. And there is an association um, in across Canada that meets on a regular basis from post-secondary institutions and from private sector. And they talk about those standards around PLAR and lifelong learning. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, moving along, just to uh, just to keep us. Sorry, bit. Yuri. Um, all right. Actually, go ahead, Jonathan. Why don't you go with? Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, and it's already been mentioned by a couple of people in the chat, uh, but there are use cases or examples uh, such as uh, the uh, building. Uh, the building information management professional certification, and uh, which is Canadian, but then there is uh, GISP for the GIS folks, uh, and and that's uh, that's global in nature. Uh, we're looking at this initially from a Canadian perspective, but we can see that our work uh, could move it up into. Uh, the global aspect uh, later on. So having noted that, um, kind of open it up. Yes, um, that's great. Thanks, Jamie. Are there any other questions that people have before we, before we close off? Um. Actually, Yuri, I hope you don't mind. I actually do have a question too for the people who are attending because I, I'm quite curious about this as a question. And for everything leading up to this, please feel free to enter any questions or ask any questions that you have. Um, but I'd like to ask why, like, hmm, you're here because you've heard about open data certification. It means something, it's useful in some way. So why is certification, how is certification useful to you or your organization? And uh, kind of a, why does, why does it matter to you? And uh, I'm curious about people's responses to that as well. Okay, I actually, Eugene, that's a great segue into uh, this poll. <laughs> you know, what's your interest in certification? Um, so if you'd like to take a look at those and. Uh, check as many uh, that are of interest to you. It doesn't have to be just one. While they're doing that, uh, Yuri, I did come across one example. It was Essex University out of the UK, and they used the Capstone Project. That's a, a, a North American standard, but also, it's a post-secondary standard. I think people are familiar with students that do Capstone Projects. It's like a culminating task in a program or a course. And they had one on open data. It was a Capstone Project on open data. Great, thanks, Jonathan. Okay, I have 
21 of 27, so that's probably as many as we're going to get. So I'm going to end the poll, share the results. So interesting, the most are looking to become certified. There's some value there. Um, joining the uh, working group, following progress, and participating in the co-design, which will be part of our next meeting in a couple of weeks. So Thanks, that's Reed. great. And, and, and actually, I, I think the, the poll ask uh, kind of answers kind of a, a few really interesting points here. But in particular, I think for those who are interested in becoming certified, I am still curious, what does certification mean? Is it um, because of some, what is the goal for certification? Is the goal a personal, professional one to get yourself you know, uh, more hireable? Is it for some goal that is specific to your organization? I guess that I'm curious about that because as Paul had pointed out earlier, there are various types of certifications. And uh, while we have a group of interested uh, particip participants here, um, I guess I'll still ask the question, uh, why is certification useful from your perspective, um, from your immediate perspective? Great question. Yep, open data professional. I think that's what we're looking at, professional in in uh, certain functional areas at certain levels. Anybody else have any thoughts uh, or suggestions as to why being certified in open data is of value? I see a couple of comments here, which stimulates a thought for me. Yeah, the standardization and credibility. I would take this myself, and I know I'm part of the panel here, but I would take it myself simply because I'd want to know that I'm covering all my bases when it comes to open data. Like there is a diversity of topics that come under this heading, potentially. Um, so, you know, knowing that uh, I've got uh, a grasp of what you need to do this uh, across the board and that I'm continuing to keep that grasp, uh, I, I, it's important not to lose sight of that. There's there's a few points around standardization. And sorry, Paul, I would echo and agree with your point as well. Um, to the question around standardization that a few people have mentioned, what does standardization mean to you? Are you referring to the standardization of data sets or operating methods? Which one in particular, or does it mean something? What, is, what does standardization mean to you? I think some have also put in there like ISO standards. Um, and I know that, again, it was at the International Open Data Conference and uh, there were people there from the ISO, or no, the IEEE, -E -E, and they actually provide funding for those that were, would use those standards in their courses, like and professional engineers teaching engineering courses, and that they would provide funding for the students that were doing projects using the IEEE -E standards. The other one that I would mention is John Hopkins. They presented on the standards and, and I believe the standards were put into the chat. So we'll, we'll capture that. So that's around um, you know, portals and the type of information, the standardized information in open data portals and the various private companies that have been established, the open data platforms for running those portals. Eugene, you probably know about, like Edmonton, are they using a particular Socrata or one of the other ones? Yeah, it's more of a platform basis, but yes, they're using Socrata. I, I suspect data standardization. Um, I, these are great comments, by the way. Thank you, Kamal and everybody else. I, I feel like we're, um, yeah, and, and same Shweta. 
uh, I hope that's your name and I'm saying it correctly, but this is really good feedback on what that looks like because, uh, sorry, to your point, Socrata is more sort of a platform, but the granularity of the data itself doesn't by any means means it's standardized, right? There's no um, way to even within the platform to really say that you have some standardization in place, I think. I hope that made sense. Uh, yeah, well, the, just following on that, the other one with these massive open online courses, the Coursera's, the edX, Udacity, uh, just to name the few of the bigger ones that are used by the POSAC, you can actually um, do these, take the material that are used in the regular program at the university or college, and you can take it, take it for free just to get a badge, or you can have it validated where you do have the proxy exams and whatnot, and then it actually would count towards a credit, a course credit towards that particular program. And in which case the validation would be done by the, by the, uh, the, the instructor from that institution. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo uh, your comments, Eugene, about these, these are very, valuable inputs uh, and will form the basis of, of uh, our next meeting, you know, kind of a community co-design where, uh, uh, where we'll set up separate uh, Zoom rooms that people can participate in, jump in and out of, uh, depending on their level of interest. Um, so we can continue this discussion because this has been extremely valuable. Uh, and I wanna thank everybody for their um, contribution and just being mindful of time. Um, just wanna make sure that, uh, that everybody, uh, you know, appreciates the fact that we'll we will have a follow-up event in uh, February and contact us uh, if you'd like to, uh, well, you can register for that meeting when, when we get it up on the website. Uh, and you can also join, obviously, the working group. So um, the emails are for uh, our connect at goopendata.ca for, for good and uh, to admin at opendatasociety.ca uh, for CODs. And you can have a look at both of our websites and see what else is going on. It's uh, it's an interesting uh, community and I think it just got an awful lot more interesting. So uh, with that, uh, I like uh, completing on time. I wanna thank everybody for their participation and don't hesitate to contact us uh, with, with any comments, further questions, uh, or interest in in working on the working group, that would be great. Okay. So again, thanks everyone. <laughs>